this one. Oh, hello everywhere. And I'm, I'm, I hope you're there. Um, can somebody indicate that they're there? Anyone indicating that they're there? Is there someone come up about them? Good to know. Okay, well, I'll assume people are there anyway, or coming in and getting here. So, um, welcome to today's uh, Bible study. Um, and uh, me and Jenny are going to talk about Revelations 1. Um, and uh, we're going to start with prayer because it's 7 o'clock. And, of course, we want to pray um, particularly about the virus. So I'm going to ask Paul to come in and uh, lead the prayer. So, Paul, would you like to come lead the prayer? Yes, I'm coming. Come in. Paul, you pray. Come on. <laughs> You see the problems we have at the vicarage at the moment, don't you? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, can we all pray together, please? Mm. Our God, your word says that you answer people when they call on your name and that you deliver them. Right now, we ask that you would heal those who are sick or who are carrying the COVID-19 virus without knowing it. Heal them and protect them, those around them. Provide a cure for the coronavirus and heal our economy. Bring a quick, miraculous end to the darkness in our world. Whether your healing comes today, next week or next month, we believe that you will heal our world. And we will continue to praise you even as we wait for answers. Please deliver us. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Hello, good evening everyone. So today we're going to look at Revelation 1. Uh, this book is written... Um, by a pastor who really cares deeply for his Christian friends who are either being persecuted um, or seduced by their hostile society. And from his exile on a nearby island, he writes a letter filled with images that would awaken hope and confidence in God in tough situations, which is very apt at the minute for us as we're in tough situations. And best of all, John gives them a vision of a personal visit, not of his own coming, but that of Lord Jesus, the greatest hope of all. Now, this is meant to be a, a letter, obviously, that gives encouragement. Laura, are there times when you've had encouraging letters or messages from friends, and how has that helped you? Do you know, I was trying to remember the last time I had a letter, but I must have had in the past encouraging letters. I, actually, I do remember, just now I remember, I do remember really encouraging letters when I didn't get to know my dad until I was about 20. And when I was in um, London, I can remember him writing letters to me um, to get to know me better, and that was actually really significant in my life. And texts, of course, now really take the place of letters in a lot of ways. So I always get encouraging texts, mostly from you lot, actually. So oh. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Laura, could you just uh, read for us? Um, I hope you've read it beforehand, but we're going to go through it. Um, verses 1 to 5, just to begin to set us off. OK. The revelation from Jesus Christ, who God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits, before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, uh, loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. That's great, thank you. So imagine that you are a member of one of those seven churches in Asia. What would you find comforting about the various descriptions of the Lord in this passage? So I think verses four and five particularly um, give us a description there and things we could look at. Laura, is any of them that really strike you or stand out to you? What really strikes me there actually as well is that it's very Trinitarian actually, isn't it? You've got the, um, uh, the one who was and is to come. You've got the, fa the Father actually, the seven spirits that represents the Holy Spirit. And then you've got Jesus Christ. And actually there's something about all aspects of God that we need, don't we, that I think is amazing. Why does the seven spirits represent the Holy Spirit? Um, because seven is represented of, the, the, the number seven is complete, so it, it's uh, perfect, therefore it's God, and that's actually what it, it stands for, is the Holy Spirit, yeah. Yes. 
Yes, because he's called faithful witness, isn't he? First born from the dead, ruler of the kings of earth. He loves us, frees us. You know, these are wonderful verses that are encouraging. Um, is there anything that you would find disturbing? I found that really hard, that question, actually. What mm. did I find disturbing? I suppose if you didn't, if you didn't know Christ, actually, if you didn't know Jesus, and you thought of him as the king of kings, the lord of lords, that could be quite disturbing that he is so powerful, isn't he? The ruler yeah. of the earth, uh, you know, the first book born from the dead. And of course, you know, other people were raised from the dead, as we know in the Bible. But actually the thing about Jesus was that he didn't just, he didn't just die again like they did. Lazarus did, died again, um, a human death. And then you have Jesus, of course, who actually um, never dies. He is the first one of his kind. So it's, it's just a, a, an amazing kind of scripture to talk about Christ, isn't it? But yeah, I don't know. It's gone off there. It's, no, it's a difficult one. <laughs> you don't have to have answers to questions. It doesn't scare me. Um, so I mean, obviously, hard. it's about the future and the present. And sometimes, you know, sort of thinking that someone can know the future is hard, isn't it? I know, yes. Those yes. ideas. Yes. A bit, some yeah. people are afraid for the future, aren't yeah. they? They're really afraid what the future yeah. will be, actually. Will we be good enough? Will we be good enough? Well, Jesus died for us. Doesn't Sorry, matter. Yeah. You are well. He is. You're not. Yeah. <laughs> um. So the word revelation means to bring to light what was formerly hidden, veiled and secret. Who and what will be unveiled by the revelation given to John? Okay. Well, I think it's probably you know stands out that it's Jesus that's going to be you know revealed here because he has has the victory. We've read over death and he's coming again his full identity his kingdom um so i sort of feel that those are the things that are going to be revealed in this letter and uh, and the the future hope actually this is actually a revelation people find it very scary um first of all a lot of the imagery of course is well-known imagery by those that were reading the old testament particularly daniel go back and have a look at daniel when you read this as well the imagery in this is they would have understood it a lot better than we do but there is something to me about this as well it's about, um, it's almost like a, our future, isn't it? It's, it's, he's saying it's all going to be all right. This is like a letter of hope, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, this brings me hope when I read it. It's like, we're all right, actually. You know, we're all going to be okay. Because I know the end of the story, as it says in the, the song, uh, in the Joseph in his Teddy kind of thingy. Um, you know, actually, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but actually, there's something here, isn't there, that actually yeah. is quite... Uh, reassuring if you know Jesus yeah if you know Jesus. and also when things start to go wrong in our world we've already been warned things are going to go wrong in our world it just proves to me more that God is who he says he is actually he says you know be, be aware this is going to happen yeah, yeah. Be aware. Laura could you read verse 7 and 8 for me certainly look he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him so shall it be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who is, was and who is to come, the Almighty. So John presents a vision of Jesus as both coming, verse 7, and already and always here, verse 8. What would it be like to have only one of these two perspectives? Well, I suppose not, well, lopsided. The first would mean that he didn't affect our life now. Yeah. And the other, that there is no eternal hope. Yeah. And that's not the full picture, is it? And the reality of our relationship with him yeah. and his promises for us. And either of those, actually, if you didn't have the other, would feel very incomplete and would not somehow be a God who is in charge of everything, would it? Yeah. Yeah. Who created it all and made it all. And who's just, it would question actually who God was, I would in that, because is, is God God, you know, if you like. Um, but that's quite a scary thought. Yeah. And to have no hope. And then if Jesus hadn't come and died and rose again, we would have no hope. That's, I don't know how people, I've said that, I know lots of people, I've heard it say in church as well, a few of you guys I know have said it, you know, what do people do without Jesus? Yeah. How do they live their life without knowing that there is a God who loves them like that? It's amazing, isn't it? Um, mm. Mm. In what ways has our knowledge of Christ's coming encouraged us in the midst of suffering? 
I guess because Jesus suffered and so there's like an end to it. Um, it. There's something as well, isn't there, about the incarnation of Christ, meaning that he walking with us in our stuff. That means he's going through it with us. And if this is the God here that we serve and know, the one that is almighty, has got the end sorted, we can trust him. It, it, it gives you a sense of... Um, knowing that actually whatever happens you've got a future that is good you know i often think of stephen and the other martyrs and john was actually the only one that wasn't martyred as far as we understand doesn't it well we, we know john was the only one that wasn't martyred you know and all the others actually that died for their faith and you think about that actually jesus was in the middle of it he was in the middle of the suffering he was with them and yet they saw the glory of the future and sometimes we don't talk enough about actually what we've got coming up you know, um, eternity is an awful lot longer than here, and it's going to be good. Yeah. That's all I know. And actually, how amazing! How amazing! Um, Laura, could you read? Let's move on. Let's do um, eight to eleven. Well, we've done eight, haven't we? Seven, yes, eight. Sorry, nine to eleven. Nine sorry. To 11. Okay. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Eph Ephesus, Samaria, Paramagala. <laughs> I can't say these. <laughs> Don't worry. I hope you're all reading them at home. There are seven Long. churches and I Difficult. haven't got the energy to say them. Okay. <laughs> I could make it up. <laughs> okay. So in uh, verse just nine, he and um, I join your brother and companion and um, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Okay, so in what ways does John's description of himself make you want to hear what he has to say? First, he mm. suffers, doesn't he? Yeah. He's suffering with them. He's not separate from them, he's with them. You know, it makes me, it reminds me of St. Paul who talks about being content in all things. There's something about the fact that St. Paul has that kind of sense of suffering, but learning actually that the internal hope means he'll be content, even though he's sitting there being flogged and mm. whatever in prison. It means that he understands, yeah. understands, and John here understands what it means to suffer um, for the sake of the gospel. He's not talking outside; he's going, "Me as one of you," and yeah. all of us suffer. All of us have suffered. All of us are suffering at different times, going through it. With and often, other. we find it easier to share our problems with someone who's been through something similar, yes. because we know they understand, That's you know, true. the suffering. So it's like that. His experience and relationship with Christ makes me want to learn from John. You know, makes yeah. me learn from him. And it's not just suffering, like crucifixion suffering. Um, suffering is, is loneliness, it's discouragement, it's frustration. It's all the things that we're all, you know, experiencing now. But he wasn't martyred, but he was being uh, exiled because of his faith for preaching. He was actually yeah, exiled because yeah. of his faith. So he was in exile, was away from him. I love the way that he discussed your brother, reminding us that we are the family mm. of God as well, isn't it? Why are the circumstances of John's receiving the revelation especially encouraging? I think it's because, you know, he's um, under island arrest rather than house arrest. And Jesus speaks to us in the difficult times. Um, and I think this is a really good opportunity, as we are now in these difficult times, to have downtime to really listen to God and put real time into deepening our relationship with God. Uh, while well, we have a slight break in our daily madness <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is the western world it is and and you know it reminds us actually that the you know i mean suffering is different for different people some people will love the solitude actually the uh, introverts of us quite enjoy a bit of time there if we're honest you know um so i kind of don't mind so much because i'm an introvert but got these guys anyway i know that but you know actually but the more, the extroverts actually that really need people all the time will find this really hard this time and we could very easily go but all we and i've said you know we are just being asked to stay home but actually for some that's really difficult and i think it's recognizing that that lack of contact with people and stuff like that is is a 
form of suffering for people. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and, you know, for some of us, I say it's a joy, and some of us, it's much harder. And we need to, as God's family, make room for each one and give each one what each one needs. And that's what Jesus does, isn't it? He meets us in it. Mm. Again, meets us in it. But what opportunity to really sit back and think about what we are as a church as well, which is very much what the rest of us know. We'll get onto that later with the seven churches. But what this is challenging us to do is think about what actually are we meant to be? First of all, you know, we are meant to be, whether in exile or not, you know, it's been there for each other. And John here was kind of there for each other, wasn't they? Yeah. He was there for them. Even though he's exiled, he's still communicating with them. Like we are today. We're in exile, but we're communicating with you. Isn't that fantastic? That's a lot quicker than writing a scroll and sending it by <laughs> <my> boat. <laughs> um, John states um, at the beginning that we will be blessed if we hear his message and take it to heart. In what ways do you think he expects us to take this message to heart? Do, is that me? You can do, or yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you can say so. Um, I, say, yeah, go on. I just think it's a good time to think about how uh, we need God to speak to us into this particular obviously, situation we're all in. Um, I think for us individually to ask God, where are you in all of this? Because although we're all under a similar situation nationally, we're all in individual obviously, situations um, in our particular household and what's going on. So I think it's really important to be honest with God and just uh, live in the present and just say, where are you in this today, mm. you know, in the difficulties? I think the truth is as well, um, so often we say an awful lot of things, but do we really believe them? Because if you really believe something, it changes how you act, who you are and, and what you do. So this actually, when you take something to the heart, it's because you really believe it. So I suppose I'm saying, what I would say is, do you really believe that Jesus is God? Do you, In that case, what difference does that make to how you're going to deal with things now and how you do deal with them? You know, do you really believe that he's coming again and the future is actually rosy? Because that will change how you deal with things when you are suffering on earth as well. But it has this bigger plan. So do you believe it? Is it real? You know, does your heart yeah. believe it? We can say it with our, 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 our mouths, we can, you know, put it in our heads, but does our heart believe it? Does that change things for me? Because I don't know, I've seen, uh, I've seen people die and uh, one of my one most privileged moments was when I was with my mum when she died and uh, I just know that she was visited by God at that moment. And my mum was so certain of where she was going. She knew her future hope. She knew she was going to be all right. I mean, I've never seen anyone so certain of something. You know, it was the most incredible thing I've ever experienced and changed me forever because not only did I just kind of know it, I really believe it now. I know, yeah, you know, yeah. it changes who we are. So, it's, so this is actually, take it to heart. This is our future. This is our future. Whatever you think, this is your future. It's a good future. It's eternal. It's forever. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fine. That's good. That's what we want. Let's read on. Let's look at verses 12 uh, to 16, Laura, if you're happy to read those out. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a gold sash around his chest. There on his head was white like wool as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of those mouth um, was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like, oh sorry, was I meant to stop there? No, um, it's up to six, end of 16. Oh yeah, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. So John pictures the seven churches as seven golden lampstands. Mm. What does this tell us about the function of the churches? So I suppose the obvious that we're lights, aren't we, mm. uh, in, our, in our communities? And Jesus stands with the church. He is our light in us and we are the light wherever we are. That's true. And his presence is ever with the church. The church is the bride of Christ, of course. It's eternal. Yeah. We are eternal. Like it or lump it, church, we're stuck with each other. That's the truth. But we're also meant to make a difference where we are. Yeah. So we're meant to shine, like you say, aren't we? We're meant to make a difference. We're meant to be the light in the darkness. Because we carry the presence of God. And haven't we not proved that it's not about a building? Yes. 
Well, you and Paul certainly have. <laughs> about whether you've got wi-fi <laughs> <laughs> but actually you know actually one thing i just want to say is um this is slightly aside but i have been absolutely astonishingly amazed at the love and the care and the help that all of you lot have given each other during this time and i see it across because i'm on every whatsapp group and I'm on every email thing and everything I see across the board it is unbelievable the care that is happening um, in this church and I just sit there I'm so proud to be the vicar of this church because it is amazing we are being the presence of God to each other we are being the bride of Christ at this moment in time the way I actually think is mind-blowing mm. and I suspect that it's happening in many churches I don't suppose it's ours but I think we're probably the best <laughs> She's biased. <laughs> Lovely you to say that. Lovely you not to say that. <laughs> well, there's only one church, of course. Yeah, the Church of Jesus Christ. No matter what you belong to. But the point is, it's watching the church when we, when the church is stripped back, when we um, seem to go through, you know, the church always, often, always grows in persecution almost. You know, it's like when we're having a hard time, it's kind of when you see God do the, his most in us as well. So, um, and that's when we really shine. So maybe we ought to have a hard time all the time just so we can shine all the time, it'd be great. Um, not that we don't, but you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so there's an amazing description of Jesus in those verses we've just read. John's vision of Jesus is rich with biblical symbolism. Instead of trying to picture all the characteristics at once, allow them to impress you one at a time. Which images impress you the most with the magnificence of Jesus and why. Perhaps you can, if you're sitting with somebody at home, you could perhaps, you know, share that. I, the, the thing that stands out to me, it's the sword coming out of the mouth. Yeah. It's partly very scary. And, and, but of course the sword relates back to Hebrews 4.12, where we talk about the word of God being the double-edged sword, which is of course why it's coming out of the mouth. But that imagery is a bit, <laughs> There's a lot of power in that. Yes, isn't there? very power powerful. Of God. And you know, um, one thing, you know, I, 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 as uh, um, ministers, leaders, as people who go out there, the, the, the most powerful thing we have is our testimony. The most powerful thing we have is talking about Jesus Christ to other people, our story of who Jesus and what he's done is. The power of the word, the power is, you know, of God's word um, and speaking the name of Jesus. You know, there is power in the name of Jesus. It's mm. amazing. Yeah. Amazing imagery in there. Um, right. Let us just look at verses seven. Let's go from to the 17 to the end. Uh, so that's 17 to 20. I just um, encourage yeah, people yeah, to uh, go and look at Daniel 7 as well, because uh, <laughs> that's where you will see um, Sam, Daniel 7, 9 around that area is where you'll see um, it referred to, again, things like he, the, he, he, the white and the blazing of the eyes and the, and the, um, the, the clay feet are all in Daniel. So that imagery is there. And I'll just say that um, the, the white hair symbolizes uh, wisdom and divinity. The blazing eyes was the judgment of evil. The golden sash it, um, represents the fact that he was a high priest. He could enter the presence of God. He is God, so he can enter the presence of God. So just to bring those up, and uh, that means also that he was able to be bring forgiveness. So Jesus, of course, is how we get forgiveness because he died and rose together. So just go and have a look at Daniel um, 7 and 9, 7, around that area anyway, and you'll see all that imagery. And those imageries will come up later as well when we do Revelation. Yeah. Nice. Cool. That's what we want. <laughs> Background information. We need it. Um, so going to read 17 to uh, 20. Okay. Do you want me to do that? Yeah. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven church. And the seven land stamps are the seven churches. Okay. So how would Jesus' words encourage John not to be fearful in his presence? 
Right, so I think 17, because um, he actually, that's why I want to say, Jesus, do, not be do not be afraid. I mean, do not be afraid. I mean, I actually, the first do, and the last. Yeah, I mean, the words do not be afraid are used so often in the Old Testament. Yeah. Sorry, Old Testament, New Testament, New Testament with Jesus. But also in Isaiah. They? I know. There's yeah, several times yeah. there in Isaiah. Do not be afraid. I'm the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And John would have walked those three years with Jesus. He would have been at the calm. He'd been at the calming of the, the calming of the, the, the you know, the uh, Galilee. He'd have been at all different things where Jesus said, "Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid." And many times he said it, you know. Yeah. And so John would have heard those words before so many times. So to have Jesus then go, "Do not be afraid." It must have been on my. Oh, it is him. You know, I wonder if he had that moment of kind of. Yeah. I recognise his voice almost. Yeah. Do not be afraid. No. Yeah, I think if God's telling you not to be afraid, I think. I think you probably right. know about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right, aren't you? If God's um, why do you think we are seldom, if ever, so overcome with awe in the presence of Jesus that we need his encouraging touch? <sighs> Can you repeat that? Yeah, that's an yeah. odd question. Isn't it? Why do you think we are seldom, if ever, so overcome with awe in the presence of Jesus that we need his encouraging touch. So seldom. I th do you think it's because we've lost, uh, we, we take it for granted? I don't know. I think it's hard to have, we, we, hard, we struggle to imagine, yeah. I think, his power and authority. We read about it, we believe it. Yeah, but we don't but actually. The experience of it, I think we struggle to comprehend, I think is probably. The yeah, I mean, if you're having a vision like this, you're seeing the power and the might of God, yeah, I suppose, yeah. aren't you? In such a way that it's going to make you go to your knees. Yeah. Um, you know, and, but there are those times, I don't know about you, but there are those times in my life, I kind of disagree with that a little bit, because there have been many times in my life I think I've been thrown to my knees and realised just how big God is and how small I am. Yeah. Um, that can be scary and comforting, I suppose. That's but the Do truth. you think there are times when people don't want more? Oh yeah, I, I think, think we hold we, back. We can hold yeah. back, can't we? Yeah. Sometimes, and some, you know. But. Do you know? I mean, choices. The thing that um, God came down to, you know, so sorry, at the beginning, you know, at the, the very beginning, Genesis. The the gift that God gave us was choice, and I don't think we talk about choice enough because I don't think we realise how powerful the gift of choice is. If we hadn't been given choice, we wouldn't have sinned. Therefore, we'd be robots. Our love would be robotic. It would be real love. You know, we choose to love God. We choose, and we choose to believe it. We choose not yeah. to believe it. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's easier to choose not to believe it. And I don't think we realise just how powerful in the spirit that choice is, actually. I really don't. Um, you know, do we believe it? Do we believe this is really God? Yeah. If this is God, you know, we're going to be okay. We need to get on our knees to him, though. We need to cry out to him. That's what we've been trying to do, isn't it? Mm. We're praying, yeah. we're praying out for this virus. I mean, today it was the highest loss in our country, you know. Um, our God is weeping with them as well. Our God is, you know, and this is our awesome God. This is our amazing God. So we need to show him reverence as well. Um, and sometimes we've made him so much, which he is our friend. But he's also mighty God, yeah. huge God, bigger than we can imagine. God of kingdoms. So there's, you know, this chapter is just so rich in uh, the promises of God and the imagery. And I really do ask you just to go away um, and, and reread it and pray about it and ask what God would be saying to you um, through this and, and particularly during this time. Um, yeah, and share so with us what you think. Yeah. As well. You yeah. know, and particularly as the weeks go on, we might, if you put some stuff up to us about what we've said this week, we're going to carry on with Revelations. What are we on Revelation next time? I can't remember. Revelation 2, obviously. Um, so next week, next week we will look at Revelation 2. But actually, if we've got questions that link in with this week and next week, we'd love to kind of bridge those gaps. So send us your thoughts, actually, of what you think um, your story is, maybe, that we could share about. What, what you think it was yeah. happening, you know, what God is being to in this. Quite so we just finished with prayer. I think so, yeah. Do you like to pray? Yes. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together discussing your word. May you enlighten us by your Holy Spirit um, and give us strength and reassurance that you are with us through all these trials. 
Protect us all, we ask, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And should we say hello to a few of them before we go? Hi, Jenna from the Isle of Man. Hi. Thank you so much Hi. for joining Hi. us. Marty. There we go. Dean. Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca again, my darling. Liz Smith. And David. Yeah. David Adams. Yeah. Sue Walsh. Liz. Sue Walsh. Bryony. Hello. And with my Bryony. Hello. Hello, all of you. Missing you loads. Ros Roslyn? Yeah. Oh, Ros. Ros. Yeah. And Pinna. And Pinna. We love you. So good to see you. Andrew Mark. Andrew Mark. Hello. And hi, Martin. Sonia. Martin. I think Alistair was in. Was yeah. Alistair in? Yeah. Oh, that would be really good. And it's just, uh, we miss you all. Just want to say, we miss you all. And uh, we hope you're really getting into the word of God. And we hope we can. Ooh, Sonia's just joined. The world. Bit just late, finishing, Sonia. Sonia. It's always one, isn't there? <laughs> 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 she just wanted to see oh. us <laughs> it's um so hard not seeing each other isn't it but uh we do see each other but you know what i mean um but think what a wonderful celebration we're gonna have when we get back together um and also i just want to say as well uh, for sunday those of you who are going to be on the zoom on sunday we are going to put out a, a little video about how to make a palm cross and we would like you all to make a palm cross and bring it to the Zoom um, service on Sunday, on Palm Sunday, okay? And I will do a ball lesson across the way. Uh, wi -Fi. Leaf. No, just not a palm leaf. No, it's a palm cross. <laughs> Having trouble there. So um, we're going to give you a little instruction. There'll be a video that comes up and goes out um, that shows you how to make that. And it would be lovely for us to be able to bring them and to, to raise them together, wouldn't it? Anyway, bless you all. Okay. See you soon. Over and out. <laughs> I think that was really good.